Right in the background, what do you see? You try it sometime. You will see toppling civilizations. You will see great white pillars against azure skies crashing in the dust of centuries. You will see marching troops and turbulent battles. And they said civilizations falling. That's what they said. All except the people who weren't upset. What'd they say? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's it. A small town minister who rose to the pinnacle of success and celebrity, Norman Vincent Peale was known to many as an exuberant pastor in the Dutch Reformed Church of America. He was shy, political, risk-taking, and pioneering in his use of the media. During a career that spanned more than seven decades, Peel was revered by millions. I don't think Dr. Peel's impact is limited to the 1950s, earlier or later. I think it's ongoing. I think what he said, what he represents, um, has been an important, represents an important cultural shift in post-World War II America. When any history is written of, of this uh, century, or social changes, or self-analysis, or the practical application of theological principles, or oratorical skills, or the use of media, or, or the uh, innovative approach to religion versus uh, practical days, daily life, I think Dr. Peel's name will always be remembered and also ways will be remembered favorably. Since leaving office, of course, it has been a difficult time. But the most important message uh, um, to a lesson to learn from that, however, is never to look back. And that was something that Dr. Peel always emphasized. He says, look forward. Uh, look forward uh, with confidence, uh, not unrealistically, but with determination. Uh, there were perhaps many factors that led to my looking forward, not, to, not frankly quitting, which I might have done, uh, giving up on life generally. Uh, but certainly one of the factors was that subconscious message which Dr. Peel, through his uh, sermons, through the personal conversations I had with him, and through his book, had left with me. That obviously played a role in my being able to still be around uh, at the present time on the American scene. You know, there are a couple of phrases uh, today that uh, when they came come to mind, I've thought of Dr. Peel. Uh, one of them is carpe diem, seize the day. And whenever I see or hear that expression now, I think of him because I think if Norman Vincent Peale had a, a battle cry for uh, people to live their lives, that might be it. Carpe diem, seize the day. The other uh, is just kind of silly, but I think it fits, is uh, Nike's slogan, just do it. I can just see Dr. Beale over and saying, look, just get up, just go for it, do it, because that's his attitude. Visualize a, an image of yourself as successful, and then, this is the quote, stamp it indelibly on your mind, never let it go. This is what Donald Trump does. Everything is a success. His uh, family uh, was very influenced by a minister named Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. The teachings of Norman Vincent Peale uh, had a, a great deal of influence on the Trump family. Fred Trump and his wife Mary began attending the church where Norman Vincent Peale was the minister in Manhattan. Um, and Donald and his two sisters were married in that church. The two parents' funerals were held in that church. And um, The Power of Positive Thinking, as the title suggests, is about how thinking positively about your accomplishments and yourself can pretty much enable you to do anything and get anywhere. And there's a list of guidelines in the first chapter, uh, 10 guidelines to success. And it's really kind of theology and business mixed together and saying it's kind of God's plan for you to be successful and go for it. The first one says uh, essentially um, visualize a, an image of yourself as successful and then this is the quote, 
Stamp it indelibly on your mind. Never let it go. And never think of yourself as failing. Don't let the idea of failure enter your mind. This is what Donald Trump does. Everything is a success. That's it. It's all successful. And there's no room for to think of failure. So these little barbs or little zingers that uh, have occasionally come up in the campaign, I mean, his usual MO is to bulldoze over them, to just like snap back. He's very, very good at coming back at people. When that doesn't work, that does throw him off his game because his game is that he's always successful. He's never failed at anything. Many years ago, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who was a colleague of mine while he was still alive, wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. It's still one of the most popular books on personal success and personal development ever written. And his basic message was, is if you think in a positive way, you'll have positive results and you'll be happy most of the time. So how do you use the power of positive thinking? Well, they did a study at the University of Pennsylvania. It was funded by some of the biggest companies in America, and over a 22-year period, they interviewed more than 350,000 people like you and I, and asked them a lot of questions about their lives and their attitudes and so on. And one of the questions they asked them is, what do you think about most of the time? Then they conducted a series of experiments, is they would have graduate students who were working on their papers in psychology and sociology phone these people once a week at random during the week and just say, what are you thinking about right now? And they'd write it down. And the next week they'd call them on a different day at a different time. And this is all prearranged that they would be expecting the call sometime. And what are you thinking about right now? And they'd write it down. Then they began to sort these groups out in terms of deciles, which is 10%. The bottom 10%, the next 10%, all the way up to the top 10%. And they noticed that people in the top 10% thought very differently from people in the bottom 80%. What do top people think about most of the time? Can you guess? The answer was so simple, it was amazing. They think about what they want and how to get it most of the time. They think about what they want and how to get They think about their goals, and they think about their priorities, and they think about their actions and activities each day. They think about the number of people they need to call on, and the number of proposals they need to put together, and the number of uh, things they need to read and to study. They're always thinking about what they want. And when you think about what you want, it makes you happy. It makes you positive. It makes you feel in control of your whole life. And then they think about how to get it. So in my seminars, I'll say that the most important word for leadership and success is the word how. Whenever you have a goal, the only question you ask is, how can I achieve this goal? If you have a problem, how can I solve this problem? If you have an obstacle, how can I overcome the obstacle? Top people think about what they want and how to get it most of the time. And as a result, they're thinking about their goal and they're thinking about the actions that they can take every single minute of every day to move faster, toward achieving that goal. Earl Nightingale once said that happiness is the progressive step-by-step -step realization of a worthy ideal or goal. When you feel yourself moving step-by-step -step, each hour, each day, toward achieving something that's important to you, you feel positive and happy most of the time. By the way, do you know what unsuccessful people think about most of the time? They think about what they don't want, the things that make them angry or sad, usually past events that they can't change, and they think about who's to blame for all their problems. So whenever you see people talking and complaining about things that they can't change, things in their life uh, that are their, their responsibility, and then blaming others for their problems, you know you're dealing with a negative, unhappy person with a very limited future and a very unhappy present. So. The way you take control of your mind, like grabbing the wheel of a vehicle, is start to think about what you want and how to get it all day long. And you automatically become positive and start to feel in complete control of your life. If you like this video, please leave a comment below and don't forget to subscribe to get new videos like this in the future.
a sermon on, in a church on a Sunday morning ought to amount to something to justify all the time and trouble you take to get here. And therefore, I always feel a sense of great responsibility and try my best. Every Sunday, looking out from my office, I see a line of people queued up to come into this church. I see them standing there in the snow and the rain and the cold and in all kinds of weather. And that's a good thing for me because I stand there looking out at them and I always say to myself, what I'm going to say is what I'm going to say this morning. Worth those people standing out there. Now, I saw you, many of you standing out there today, but I'm not apologetic today because I have something to talk to you about that is terrifically important. And it is hope. I would like to think that everybody would go from this church this morning full of hope. Because as the Bible says, we are saved by hope. Now, if you always keep hope going for you, you may realize your fondest dreams. If you always keep hope going for you, you may realize your most cherished goals. If you always keep hope going for you, you will be able to overcome every difficulty solve every problem, rise above every defeat, and win a just and wonderful victory in this life. Hope, it's one of the three greatest words in the Bible. And now abideth faith, hope, and love these three but the greatest of these is love but that must mean the second greatest is either hope or faith <laughs> well you know in preaching a sermon I always fall back on good old Bartlett's quotations I admit it some people quote without admitting that they found it in Bartlett. <laughs> what would we do without good old Mr. Bartlett? Well, I looked up hope. It's mentioned many times. There's a man named Robert Bridges, a poet who lived a long while ago. He says, anybody could have figured this out, hope is a better companion than fear. Certainly. <laughs> but here's a statement that's really a classic. Hope is ever livelier than despair. Isn't that a beauty? <laughs> Hope is alive. Despair is dead. Herbert Spencer, back in 1591, advised his readers to feed on hope. And then we come to Sidney Smith. He says, hope for the best and trust in God. Hope is the belief that joys will come. But he got off on another subject uh, in the same page on which I was reading. Has no relation to the subject matter of this sermon. But 
he said away back in somewhere between 1771 and 1845, which was his lifespan, he came up with the assertion that preaching has become a byword for long and dull conversation of any kind. <laughs> I really think that rules him out as an intellectual critic. <laughs> then we've got to get a quotation in here from good old Shakespeare. What a man he must have been. How, did, how was all the wisdom uh, in, that he had in one head? Must have been remarkable. He speaks about Henry IV, who lined himself with hope. Just get hope all through you. Line it. Line your brain with hope. And Matthew Arnold says, still nursing the unconquerable hope. The Alexander Pope, hope springs eternal in the human breast. God put it there because we can't live without hope. Carl Sandburg said, who can live without hope? And the Bible, finally, I don't think that amounts to anything. No, <laughs> we are saved by hope. Now you see, if this is the case, it's all the more reason why we should be committed Christians. Because when you know Jesus Christ, you know all of these great qualities. You have faith, you have love, and you have hope. A synonym for hope could be expect. Who can live without expectation that there's something good in the future? If you had to get up in the morning and say, nothing good is ever going to happen to me, how good would your life be? When you can get up in the morning and hope that you have your skills, that you'll have your ability to succeed, that you'll have clarity of mind, then you live. In our magazine guidepost, we have a story by a famous professional basketball player named Otis Birdsong now playing with the New Jersey Nets, formerly with Kansas City Kings. He was on the championship team of the NBA, National Basketball Association. He averaged 26 points per game. One of the great players of our time. He was raised by a Christian mother, prays daily, reads the Bible every day, goes to church, is a Christian young man. But he went into a slump. Now, do you know what a slump is? <laughs> I certainly do. I've been in them myself. It's when you can't seem to do it. It's like making a speech or preaching a sermon. You can't get it over. There's no flow. There's no harmony. There's no uh, rapport. The words won't come. And if they come, the wrong ones come. <laughs> a slump. Well, a basketball player in a slump, he was skillful in making his shots whoosh through the basket, but night after night, they would go up to the basket and roll around the rim and drop on the outside on the floor. Night after night, 
he was in the slump. And the whole team got in the slump. And whereas they had won the championship the year before, now they were about 12 games behind. So he paced the floor. What should he do? And the thought came to him, talk to mom, mother. Well, he said, what's she know about basketball? <laughs> she doesn't even know the terms. She doesn't even know how to score a game. Why should I talk to mom? But finally he did, he dialed the telephone. And in a glum, sad voice, he said, hello, mom. She said, Otis, what's the matter with you? He said, who said anything was the matter with me? She says, I am your mother. And I know when something is wrong with you. What's the trouble, son? Haven't you been praying, reading the Bible, and going to church like I brought you up to do? He says, yes, Mom, I have. But I am in a slump. She said, please tell me what is a slump. <laughs> he described a slump. Oh, she said, I've been in a lot of those myself. But mom, he says, you don't understand. I'm, I'm a professional champion basketball player and I can't get the ball in the basket. <laughs> and I said, in order to win, you have to get it in the basket more times than the other team gets it in the basket. Do you understand? <laughs> she said, yes, I understand. You haven't been praying as much as you should. And you haven't been reading the Bible. Oh, he said, Mom, what's that got to do with it? She says, what's that got to do with it? Everything. Now she said, son, you just go back and read the Bible and pray and believe and hope and have faith and you will get that ball in that basket. Goodbye, son. <laughs> that night, <laughs> it seems too apt, but that night he shot 35 baskets and a whole team came out of the slump. And uh, as he went home that night, he said, mothers are funny things. They don't know nothing about anything. But they know everything about everything. If they are in the Lord. Now, Mrs. Birdsong reared a big family of 12 children. And you can't do that without character, courage, and faith, and wisdom. And the wisdom of it was this boy was out of the flow. He was out of correlation. He was no longer in harmony. Therefore, this elusive ball wouldn't go into that little basket. The trouble wasn't in his physical mechanism. It was in his mental apparatus. And that was out of whack. That was out of harmony. But when his mother, whom he loved, and in whom he believed more than anybody on earth, told him that he wasn't believing enough, that he wasn't praying enough, that he wasn't hoping enough, he had a complete reversal of the mental processes 
So once again, he recaptured the old time genius, the old time flow and power. That's what the Bible may mean when it says, we are saved by hope. So if things aren't going very well with you, if you're disturbed, discouraged, about them, keep that mind of yours, that sensitive instrument in harmony with the Lord Jesus, who had the greatest mind of any person who ever lived on this earth, and keep it sensitized to him, and uh, power will flow. You'll be saved by hope. Well, that's uh, one thing. And the other thing is that hope lifts us always out of our hopelessness. There is one of the most devastating words in the English language, hopelessness. It's, it's, it's proper that it would have less in the middle of it. Hopelessness. It goes down, you see, into complete frustration and failure. Whoever figured out the English language is a smart man because he knows how to put pictures into words. I never thought of this before. I'm just thinking of it on the spur of the moment, but it's not a bad idea. <laughs> Hopelessness doesn't lead up. Hopelessness leads down. What leads you up then? It is hope. If you're without hope, you're without life. Always believe that joys will come. Always keep expectation alive. I was in a certain city the other day when I met a friend of mine who is probably one of, if not the, most highly respected man in that city. And as always, when I stood with him, I realized I was in the presence of a miracle. He was gifted in early youth with a charming personality. He was hired by a bank to do a routine job, but his personality made itself felt so that they assigned him the job of entertaining prominent customers of the bank, especially from out of town. And they gave him a membership in the leading club of the city. And he got the notion that the way to entertain customers was to uh, encourage them to drink plenty of alcohol. So he would have luncheons and the alcohol flowed, the whiskey flowed, the brandy flowed, the vodka flowed, everything flowed. And of course, he felt that where anybody else had a drink, he should have a drink. And it got so that he'd go back to the bank in the afternoon completely intoxicated, reeling and inebriated. And they'd send him home. Got so that he would show up at the bank at nine o'clock in the morning, drunk. And he got so bad that they couldn't use him anymore to entertain customers. And he got so bad that after a while he couldn't use him, period. By this time, he'd become one of the vice presidents of the bank. So the banker called him in and he said, I'm sorry, Bill, which isn't his name, Bill, I've got to let you go. Sorry about it. And he said, furthermore, you are such a despicable character that I'm going to see to it that no bank in this state hires you. You'll never get a job. And the more I knew it because this man was the dean of all the bankers in the state. 
So after a while, his wife got fed up with him. She left him. He had two children. They'd have nothing to do with him. He lost his beautiful home in the country club district. He was thrown out of the membership of the other downtown club. He was thrown out of the country club where he played golf. Finally, his money went. And his friends ignored him. And it got so that he panhandled on the street of the very city in which he'd been a top vice president of the biggest bank in the state. What you might call, in the old terminology, a bum. Then he got himself committed to an institution for alcoholics under the state because he had no money to go elsewhere. And there was an atheist there. And the atheist said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, I understand that you were chairman of the board of elders and deacons of the First Presbyterian Church. Yeah, he said, I was. They threw me out. Well, he said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. You believe in God. We both landed in the same place. So your God must not mount to marry much. This was the thing that first got to my friend. Finally, he left this place. And he went back home to his mother. Strange, isn't it, how you run to mama? <laughs> That's built into us. Run to mama. So mama said, son, there's only one way for you to recoup. And that is to really get converted to Jesus Christ because you have been a spiritual failure. And I'm honored to say that she made him read a couple of my books. And one day, under a tree on that farm of his mother's, he committed himself to Jesus Christ. And it took instantly. He no longer had the alcohol problem went back, gradually worked up into the bank across the street. Then one day I heard he had cancer. And I called him on the phone and I said, don't let us throw you, old boy. I was afraid he'd go back to the other. He said, don't you worry. Jesus, who freed me from the other, will take care of me in this. He later became head of the Cancer Society of his state. He's still healthy after these many years. And not long ago, they put up in his city an eternal flame in the central plaza. And they dedicated it to him. And I asked him, did you ever lose heart? No, he said. Because when I read the Bible one day, I read where it said, we are saved by hope. So I've hung on to hope. And that has pulled me through until this day. I stood and looked at him. He's got gray hair now. Fine looking, almost venerable man a testimony to the incredible power of the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we have hope to save us. Our Heavenly Father, we conceive of this as being of the gospel and we preach this sermon because we believe in what we've said, that if there's anyone here present amongst these fine people in whom hope is low or the flame going out, 
revive it again by your loving grace and your wondrous power. Hi, thank you for watching this video. I hope you have really enjoyed it. Please share your feedback and comments and like and subscribe.